Welcome to the third part of the lecture, number one. Now we're going to talk about the curvilinear coordinate systems. Suppose our particle P is moving along a path as shown here. We'll define some vectors, uh, unit vectors called E sub T, the tangent to path, E sub N, normal to the path, and then E sub B. This B comes from what's called a bi- a biharmonic. Sorry for the, the handwriting on this silly acrobat, but that's the way it is. This is biharmonic unit vector. Okay, So you have the center of curvature at this particular point, and this curvature will be shifting around all the time as this particle is moving. This is instantaneous center of curvature. Same idea here is this instantaneous radius of curvature. The tangential the tangent to path, normal to path, and yet another vector normal to the path. And we have these omega vectors. We have omega, right? The particle is, as it's moving, is actually causing these unit vectors to rotate, and that's defined by omega. A part of it is the rotation omega t, which says that e sub n and e sub b is rotating about this e sub t vector. And then we also have the rotation about the biharmonic vector, which is e sub n and e sub t is changing its direction. All right. So suppose our particle is moving along the path as, shown, as we just shown. Over a very short time, the particle will move a very short distance d sub s. The vector r to p moves by about dr, ds, e sub t, if we let e sub t be the unit vector tangent to the path. Okay, so here's our tangent vector. And we just note that, we just note that this is not quite right. This should be dr. Okay. And we'll note that s is the distance along the path. Et is related to the velocity of this point as well. If you remember that the velocity vector is just time derivative of the position vector, we can write that out in a chain rule where we have this instantaneous change along the path as ds through the chain rule of calculus. The second one is the speed on of the particle along the path, or in other words, s dot. So, in other words, v is equal to s dot e hat sub t. In other words, that kind of makes some sense. The velocity of a particle is just its velocity along the path. It's not the path describes well how it's going to move, so it's naturally you might expect that the speed of the particle along the path would be its velocity, but just using this unit vector. The acceleration is given by the time derivative v, Okay, and that's the second derivative of the position vector r. Sorry about this. And that's equal to s double dot e sub t plus s dot e sub t dot. Okay, and notice, yeah, sure enough, we got to look about what that is. Okay, and again, we could write it as omega cross e sub t, but that's really nice, but again, we're left wondering what omega is. And if you remember from the definition of omega, that for a split second, omega is defined from the motion of p along the path. Okay, remember when we were talking about this b, b prime, and we have a particle p, and it's moving from about this path from p prime to p double prime. The circular arc is in a plane and has a center point c, and we call this radius rho the radius of curvature. The particle p is moving towards the arc's center and it's in the plane described by the arc, P, C, and E, T hat. In other words, it's called the osculating plane. It's just the plane by which this particle is moving in. And that plane will be moving around all the time. So here's our particle P. It's moving along this path. And here's our, our center of curvature. This is the radius of curvature. And as this particle is moving, it's long, moving along E, to e hat T. Okay, And E hat T, E hat N, E hat B form a right-handed coordinate system, so you might say T N B, like so, all right, and B, the E sub B, I should say, is perpendicular to this so-called osculating plane. As the particle moves along the path, then this omega sub B is omega B E sub B, and that's part of omega, but not the whole story. The other part is omega T e sub t. So altogether, those two give us omega. We have omega b e sub b plus omega t e sub t. 
So it can rotate about E sub B and it can rotate about E sub T. In combination two is the total omega for this curvilinear coordinate system. So in other words, this remember we what we were looking for in the original in the first place is E sub T dot. And that's omega cross E sub T. Like that. And so we substitute in for omega, and that's cross ET, and so that ends up being omega B E sub N. That's ET ET, that's zero E B E T, E B E T, that's E sub N with a positive sign, so that's omega B E sub N. Okay? Turns out we can express E sub B hat in terms of in terms of the speed of the particle S dot and the instantaneous radius of the curvature rho. And then so what we can do is we can write out that V is equal to omega cross minus rho E sub n. And we end up writing that omega B itself is S dot over rho. So in other words, this tangential, the rate of change of the tangential unit vector is S dot divided by rho along E sub n. Acceleration then is S double dot E sub t. That's what we had before. And then we have this, this part where we had to go through this, all this trouble of finding what E sub t dot is and it turns out to be the centripetal or normal acceleration. So you have acceleration of this particle along the path and then you have the acceleration of the particle due to the change of the direction of the path. That's after all what centripetal acceleration really means. The tangential acceleration is the acceleration of the particle as it's, as it's moving along the path. Okay. And if S, S dot is equal to a constant, acceleration isn't necessarily equal to zero. And if the part if particle isn't accelerating along the path, that does not necessarily mean this is also zero, right? It means that if the path is changing direction, you'll still have acceleration. If we look at the other unit vector derivatives, we can find the same thing. We just use omega all over again, where we have right what we had been defined before, and we can find each of these omegas as shown here, in such a way that that we can get the, the remaining time derivatives of the unit vectors. So let's look at some examples. Here's a helical motion. So we have a helix that co coils upwards, as shown here. And it's going upwards and upwards, something like a DNA or something like that. If you look at it from the side, from the XZ plane is shown drawn on the page, then it coils upward and upward. And with a helix here, it's a constant slope given by kappa, okay, by an angle kappa, all right? And we'll say the x, y, and z are the fixed coordinate systems for the moment, and then we have the coordinate system defined uh, along r, along the radius, and then we have phi along the, the circumferen uh, circumferential direction, and then another vector here along z, okay? And notice I'm using, for our unit vectors, I'm using u um, to, to match some, some other text that we often see. So a particle moves in a helix, and so we'll say a particle moves along this helix all right, at a speed, say the dot, and we'll just call that omega. Notice these aren't vectors. And we'll say that the radius of the helix is equal to r sub c here. So the radius from this point to this point is equal to r sub c. And so the z is equal to the slope kappa times r sub c times theta. The reason is, is that if you go around this by distance theta, right, that's not a distance, that's an angle, isn't it? The real distance is r c times theta. That's the actual distance. And this kappa represents the rise over run, or the slope, in other words. So what is the run? The run is the distance we've gone, r c theta. Multiplied by kappa, we get the rise. The rise is z. What we're looking for is the acceleration of the particle. All right, so let's see how we can go about finding it. If you look at the system, you could pick a spherical coordinate system. You can also pick a, a Cartesian coordinate system. But notice that this helix follows along. If we drew in a big cylinder, it would follow along the surface of that cylinder. So here we're going to pick a cylindrical coordinate system. The acceleration for the cylindrical coordinate system, we could derive it. We could actually put in what the position vector is and take two time derivatives of the position vector. 
probably the better way to go. But here we're going to just use the formula that we found through derivation earlier in the lecture. Acceleration is given by r double dot minus r theta dot squared along the east of r direction, 2r dot phi dot plus r phi double dot along the east of phi direction, plus z double dot east of z along the z direction. But we have here that r is equal to a constant r sub c, and so then r dot and r double dot, they're going to be equal to zero. So there's no acceleration of the particle along the radial direction in this cylindrical coordinate system. And phi dot is equal to a constant omega, and so phi double dot is equal to omega dot. And notice that we didn't say that omega is equal to a constant, did we? So after all, omega dot might not be actually equal to zero. And then finally, z is equal to kappa r sub c theta, where z is equal to kappa r sub c theta dot. We just take the time derivative. This is a constant, this is a constant, so all we have from time derivative on the right is theta dot. If you take a second derivative, we end up with theta double dot, and that turns out to be just omega dot, doesn't it? So substituting in gives us r sub c omega squared, along the east of r direction. This is equal to zero. This is equal to zero, but this part, r phi double dot, well that's r c omega dot east of phi, plus the z double dot we already have found here, kappa r sub c omega dot east of z. This is our solution, or at least all we can find for the time being.